Hey, what's going on everybody? Hey, this is Joseph Green with my lovely and sweet grandma right here, Miss Evelyn Willoughby. Uh, I want to introduce yourself and tell everybody how young you are. My name is Evelyn Willoughby, and I'm just 85 years old. Amen. And when I say she does everything, still dry, she cooks. She maintains, she have a garden, she does some everything. Tell everybody what you grow back in your garden. Uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, okra, peppers of all kinds, greens sometimes, uh, have apple trees, pear trees, plum trees, pull the weeds, all the weeds in the yard. Was cutting the grass till somebody stole my two lawnmowers. But uh, I do everything, anything I need to be done. And thank God for being able to do it. Hey, man, look at here. Can you tell everybody what it was like when you was growing up, some of the things that you went through as far as, um, I ain't gonna even say like racism or nothing like that, but what were some of the hardest things that you experienced, you know, growing up as a, as a young lady? Well, I was born in a little town called Kentwood, Louisiana. And uh, first, well, where I was born, I can remember uh, my dad was a farmer. And thank God he'd gotten too old to raise cotton when I got big enough to pick it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, as a child, you know, when you were too young to pick the cotton and if there was a a baby in the family that four and five, six year olds stayed at the end of the row and watched the baby to make sure no snake or nothing crawled by the baby. And the mama and their sisters and brothers when the school was out would pick cotton. And you stayed at the end of the row and you watched the baby when you were too little to pick the cotton. And, uh, but like I said, my dad, he was 50, two years older than me. So by the time when I, by the time I got old enough to pick cotton, he he was too old to raise cotton. But he had gardens and he raised corn and different stuff and we had it was eleven of us but eleven of us never lived at home because by the time I was born my second brother had four children. My oldest brother was married and had a child. And uh, so we never, like I said, there was never 11 children staying at home. All I remember staying at home all the time was the, level, the last four. And then when I was six, my oldest six years old, my oldest sister had a child. So my mom kept him. And so from six years old, I used to babysit. I learned to pin a diaper. And though they, you fold a diaper and triangle and you use one big safety pin. <laughs> So it wasn't hard for me and my little brother to put a pin a diaper on the baby. My older sister and them, they would go to school. And before I was old enough to go to school, my dad would go about a mile away from home for the garden. So sometimes he would leave me and my little brother with the baby. And we used to like to jump in the bed, my mom's bed. And it was those days they had them wire spring. And it's something like a trampoline the children have now. But if we got caught doing it, we were in trouble. And one day we forgot to put the baby in the center of the bed. And we were jumping in the bed and the baby rolled out the bed. But thank God he didn't get hurt because we were afraid. But, uh, but God just blessed us. You know, we didn't have no inside water and inside toilet. Nothing like that. We had an outdoor toilet. You had to go draw water out of the well. It wasn't hard because that's what we had to do. And uh, at night and day, you fed the chickens. And I thank God that when I was seven years old, I was so proud I learned how to milk a cow. <laughs> that was, boy, that was a big accomplishment for, for me. And we had to milk the cow in the morning before we went to school, and in the evening, you had to milk the cow. And uh, so, you know, we. That's what we had to do, and it wasn't hard because that was something you had to do. You had wood stove, wood fireplace, and you had to cut wood. If you wanted to eat, 
You had to get out there and cut that wood. Split them low, cut them low, split it. I used to get kind of upset and think I was hurting somebody and I'd stack wood so tall on my arm I couldn't even see over it. But I wasn't hurting nobody but me. Mm. <laughs> and uh, But you know, we lived that way. Didn't have a come out refrigerator? No, we didn't even have an ice box. When I was 10 years old, up to the time I was 10 years old, we didn't have an ice box. You cooked the food and you ate all you cooked. If you've been town and got some meat, you ate it all that meat that day. And uh, for beef, but pork, they kill pork once a year, kill pig, and then they'd smoke the meat or salt it down. So you had salt meat all you had smoked meat, and that would last your whole year. When they killed the hog, all the neighbors got a piece of meat. That's the way it was, and my dad was a giver. Whatever many people would come to his house, Mr. Levi, when mama wanna borrow a bucket of peas or borrow a watermelon. And after I got grown, I realized, now Papa know them people ain't had no garden to pay nothing back, but he never turned anybody down. He was just that kind of loving person. He would never turn, and people would always come and borrow this or borrow that. If he had it, they got it. Mm -hmm. But as a child, and like I said, was picking blackberries and huckleberries and different stuff like that. You just went in the woods, and, and, and you found it out there in the woods, muscadines and things of that sort. And Mama would always make muscadine jelly blackberry jelly, blackberry pies, uh, persimmon, that's something people don't even know nothing about no more. But plums, all that was like out in the woods, wow. You didn't, you know, you didn't have to go buy none of that. That grew and you go out in the woods and find it. Let me ask you this here. Normally when you was, if you had got sick, cause I know back then when people got sick, they didn't get really get sick as often as they get sick now. Uh, because you know, we wasn't really. Uh, I think now we just because we use so much salt and so much different chemicals into the food and stuff. And back then, everything was basically pure. Mm -hmm. So when a person got sick, what did y'all use to use as far as to, like, if they had a common cold? Like I know they used to use. Um, I can't think of the name, but they used to have the man with the big fish on the back. Uh, I forgot the. I can't think of the name of it that they used well, to. Well, we didn't say cold. During the spring and the fall, you got in line and you took castor oil. That's what it is. That's what we did. Mm -hmm. We didn't hardly have a cold. Very seldom you had a cold. Didn't hardly get sick. But uh, yeah, every every because when spring you took castor oil, but the fall you took castor oil. I first time I went to the doctor, I was pregnant. <laughs> I never went to a doctor. I did go to the dentist when I must have been about twelve or thirteen. But mm -hmm. as far as going to a doctor, no, we didn't go to no doctor. My dad would give casserole, even turpentine. You would take yeah. a teaspoon of sugar and put a couple of drops of turpentine on it if you had a cold. Or my dad would take. On a pine tree, there's rosin, and the rosin would get dry and kind of hard, and he beat it up real fine and mixed sugar with it, and he kept it in a little bag. And sometimes, you know, I'd go there and kind of steal a little bit of it because it was good. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what, you know, that's what they gave you. You didn't go mm -hmm. to no doctor, and uh, if you cut your knee or something, they put... I believe it was tallow and soot and and put that on it and you got well you got healed mm -hmm. didn't, they didn't take you to no doctor for the least little thing <laughs> you didn't go to no doctor no. you ate vegetables you ate greens and it was see people talk about organic now they really don't know what organic is see organic was you, the cow manure, you pile that up during the winter in a corner of the yard, the barnyard, 
And then in spring, you took that manure and spread it in your garden. And that was the fertilizer. And that, that was, that's organic. Now, I don't know what they put in stuff now and talk about organic. Mm -hmm. But that's a, you, you, you recycle the manure and that was your fertilizer and you raise your garden. And that's the way it was then. Mm -hmm. But I mean, now they talk about a lot of, there's a lot of chemicals. We didn't have chemicals that during that time. Yeah. When you said the first time you went to the uh, to the doctor, you, you was pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> was it a surprise to you? What? That no. You, that you was pregnant? Mm-mm. I was eight months pregnant. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know? Yeah, I knew. Oh, you knew? You just didn't want to say that uh. No, I just didn't go to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So, by you already knowing that you was pregnant, I mean, what was it like the, uh, the first time? You know, just going to the doctor just to verify that yeah, you hear you here it is, you pregnant, eight months, and uh, to have your first child. Well, I didn't have to verify it. I knew it. Mm -hmm. They verify something you don't know. It. <laughs> You're not sure. Yeah. But I knew it. I mm -hmm. was living in Kentwood, but I went to New Orleans and went to Charity Hospital in order to have the baby. So, but like I said, but I was living in Kentwood. I, mm -hmm. I, I did everything I used to do. I didn't cut wood, whatever I had to do. I'd move. We had moved a little closer to town by then. And mm -hmm. we did have water inside, but still had the outdoor toilet and everything. Mm -hmm. and my dad still raised the garden. We ate greens almost every day. And I had to make biscuits every day, because I said, once I get grown, I'm not making biscuits and I'm not cooking mustard greens. But mm -hmm. I did cook the mustard greens, but I've never made the biscuits. Because <laughs> I had to do that sometimes three times a day, breakfast, mm -hmm. lunch, well, break, they call it breakfast, dinner, and supper. It wasn't lunch during that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that's the way it was, and that's what we did. Yeah. Um, how many kids do you have total? Nine children. Nine children. Six girls and three boys. And when your son, Keith, when he was murdered, um, what, what went through your mind when you first got the call? Well, when I first got the call, police didn't call me. His supervisor called me to give me condolences. And I told him, you, have, you must have the wrong number. And so she hung up and she called me back later and I talked to the policeman. And she gave me the number of a policeman and I called him mm. and found out it was hard, but I could not really grieve because my husband was dying. He had prostate cancer and I was taking care of him. So I didn't I didn't want him to die earlier than, you know, he was in hospice care. So I didn't want to show how I felt to make him worse. Mm -hmm. And I know my children were grieving. So I had to hold on with the help of God. I was able to hold on because Pete had gotten killed. He got hit on the side of the road by a drunk driver. They didn't find the body, no nothing but his fishing poles in the street. But what happened, the guy, he ended up on top of the guy's car and he drove down, the witness said he drove down and turned into a cemetery. And that's probably the way he had it all night. But uh, I did more investigating than the, the sheriff and the police there did, because I ended up writing and tell them what happened. But it was just the goodness of God. And uh, like I think sometimes, like people talk about Black Lives Matter, I could be in the head of that line because they didn't do nothing to this man. They didn't, you know, they would have made him pay something, but my granddaughter uh, didn't do nothing. You couldn't talk to her. She got lawyers, and the lawyers told her don't talk to me because they wanted the money, and that's where it ended up mm -hmm. doing more of that. Uh, you know, 
Yeah. But God brought me through. God, God was with me. He gave me strength to go through all of that. Can you tell the people what you said when you was on the stand? And uh, well, most people would have probably went off and would have been so angry, even though you was angry, but you had forgiveness in your heart. Can you do you remember what you said when you was on the stand? When it was in front of the judge? Yes, ma'am. The judge asked me, did I forgive him? And I told him, yes, I forgive him because I would not my I would not be consumed with hate. Mm -hmm. And sure, so I forgive him. So then the judge asked him that he apologized. And I told him, no, he had not said anything. I said, no, your apology is no good now. I said, that's just like a parent making a child apologize for something they've done. And you saying it now, it don't hit on nothing now. Mm -hmm. But I told, I told the, the judge, no, I, I've forgiven him because I'm not going to be consumed with hate. Yeah. And so, you know, that's the way it then. And I, during that time, I wrote uh, district attorney letters. I wrote letters to the sheriff. And I just told them, I, you know, just what happened. And I, that I knew more what did more investigating than they did. And there were lawyers and my granddaughter had gotten three daughters the day before my son was buried she and her mom because my son had divorced his wife about 10 years or so and she was still upset and angry so she got with her daughter and the day we buried my son and I told her I said okay I'm gonna come down because it was in Huntsville Alabama and we'll get everything straight for you and they brought him hand me a paper that they'd already gotten three lawyers. So all I could do was pray for them because mm -hmm. the lawyers ended up getting money that this child could have had to build a house. And my son had just bought a house. She could have kept that, but nothing you can do when, when child don't listen to her. And she was 18 years old. Yeah. And she had, my son's first grandchild, the baby was about three weeks old when he had gotten hit with the car. But uh, God is good and he's been with me and has kept me and going through a lot of things. How I can do it, depend and have faith on God, in God. Yeah. And right before your husband passed, how long have y'all been married? 57 years. 57 years. Um, to first lose your son and then wind up turning around not long after that you wind up losing your husband mm -hmm. and uh so how did you manage to handle you know one death right behind the next well, i can say god gave me strength to do it to be able to go through take care of my husband well I'd been doing that we came to Memphis in 2005 and uh, he had prostate cancer and I had taken care of him but you know he had gotten aware he was like a newborn baby but it was rough like I said with my son he had retired in 2010 and he moved to Huntsville, Alabama because he loved fishing. And this was a lot of, you know, water, good fishing places. And that was three hours from us where he lived and my sister lived in Georgia after Katrina. So three hours from her. So he could come on Saturday, go check on her and he'd come visit us. And uh, so, you know, we visited down there with him, but he loved fishing. And it was just, you know, something. It was like every morning he would call us. And he, he worked on the Army base. He was retired from the Army, but he worked on the Army base. 
and he'd say, hold on till I go through the gate, because that's what he had to do. Well, that I missed more than anything, but for a long time, I did not see him dead. Mm. It's strange, but the Saturday before his funeral, we had to go to a funeral home, you know, and look at the body and everything. I did not see Keith. I saw Brandon's face, my oldest grandson. I saw Brandon's face in the coffin. But that didn't bother me because Brandon was standing right beside me. It's mm. strange. And see, Keith had been to Iraq twice. And it's just in my mind, it was like, you know, he's not dead, he's in Iraq. Yeah. He's in the army away. The only thing I miss is that he's not calling every day like he was and for a long time. So I kept in contact with his pastor and his supervisor. And in order to really get the realization that he was gone for good, I had to stop talking to them. Mm -hmm. Because as long as I could talk with them about him, yeah. to me, he was alive gotcha. in my heart. Mm -hmm. So when I realized, I said, as long as I talk to him, I still feel he's alive within me. Mm -hmm. And so to really feel and know that he's gone forever, I had to stop talking to them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. What was the last conversation you and Keith had? Well, he was here the Saturday before he died. And it's a strange thing. That Saturday, a bird kept flying into the glass door by my patio. For about an hour, the bird was flying into the glass. And if I go to the door, he'd sit on the floor. He just moved back from the door and sat on the floor. And that bird kept on flying against the glass. And I told Keith, I said, Keith, that old bird keep hit flying against the glass. I don't know what's wrong with him. He said, well, open the door and let him in. I said, no, he might get in here and die, and then I can't find him, and he'd be stinky. And mm -hmm. he just laughed, and I can, that I remember more than anything, <laughs> but that, that bird, mm -hmm kept flying and that was a warning yeah and but it's a strange thing i mean kept flying into the left and they did it for hours i went and opened the door and stood there look he'd get back from the door and sit on the floor mm -hmm. and then he'd fly yeah because they always say normally before someone passes, there's always something that they are say to indicate something like hey this might be my last time and this and that and i remember me and you were talking on the phone one day and you had mentioned about the glass, the window and you said uh, you was looking out the window and you kept going outside to wipe the outside of the window. Mm -hmm. Can you tell everybody that story? <laughs> okay. The glass that was to the patio the glass was dirty and I kept looking so so I got got me a towel and I cleaned the glass on the inside. And I looked, I said, the glass still dirty. It's like, oh, it's outside. So I went outside and cleaned the glass. And it reminded me, I said, well, sometimes that's the way we are. We clean the outside, but the inside is still not right. Yeah. So sometimes we, we look you know, mm -hmm. say the right thing, dress the right way, but we still ain't clean on the inside. Yeah, say all dressed up and looking good, smelling mm -hmm. good, but and the inside is tore. Still, it's still not right with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 57 years of marriage. What would you tell young couples who are thinking about getting married? What's the secret to longevity? as far as being married 57 years? Well, first of all, we got to love one another and remember what the vows are. Sickness and death. 
bad times, good times. Mm -hmm. And there are times as a wife, you had to shut your mouth. Because the very thing one day that you might cause an argument, a week later you can discuss it very calmly and easy. And sometimes, you know, you can be right or you can be wrong, but learn to agree and learn to disagree. And the Bible tells us love one another. Mm -hmm. Love, not hate. So I've, I've always asked this question, and I asked it in church. How can two people, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, get a divorce? <laughs> That's a question I've asked. Because the Bible yeah. tells us to love one another. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if we love one another, there's nothing the husband is going to do so bad that the wife can't forgive him. And there's nothing she should do so bad that he can't forgive her mm -hmm. if they are saved. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let me answer this here. Because I, I done been married before, been divorced. And uh, just, let me ask you, just said, do you agree to this? That sometimes what man put together don't mean God put it together. Well, because I, I knew exactly when at that time the my wife when she was walking, I knew truly in my heart that I didn't love her like a husband supposed to love a wife. But it was like I done came this far. I know. Let me just do the right thing. And you know when you growing up. You know, everybody tells you, you know, do the right thing. You know, don't be shacking and this and that. And when you didn't shack for so long and you know, hey, I, I need to do the right thing because I really want to really want to make a change. But the person that you're with, you know that you truly don't love them. But in your mind, and I think this is why I went wrong. I was putting myself to a point to where I felt like eventually I would grow to learn to love that person. And that's why I made my mistake at were you saved and was she saved? That'd make a difference. Nah. Okay. That'd nah. make a difference. Yeah. Well, see, my question is, yeah. two people. Who are saved. Saved. How can they wind up getting a divorce if they saved? and They both are saved. Mm -hmm. If I'm saved, I'm not going to do anything so bad for my husband to not love me or can't forgive me. Mm -hmm. See, we got to forgive. See, that's one of the things that yeah. couples don't forgive one another. Yeah. But you got couples that, you know, if they are uh, family members living, and, you know, you might have a, a, a man that's married to a woman, and he's, he's clinging to his mom. And sometimes the woman might feel like, you know, hey, I understand you're going to help your mom, but you, you have a house over here, too, that you need to take care of. Mm -hmm. But he's taking care of his household. But he's also, too, going to take care of his mom as well. And sometimes some women, I'm not saying all women, but some women feel like, okay, uh, I need you here. I understand, you know, but you got other siblings that can take care of your mom as well. So why is you doing all the work? Well, she still has to be understanding, and he has to be understanding. Yeah. That make it's something they need to discuss more so. Mm -hmm. like I know my neighbor used to say all the time, two can take care of 12, but 12 can't take care of two. Yeah. I mean, if mm -hmm. a couple got 12 children, they can take care of them 12 children, yeah. but them 12 children can't, can't take, take care, care of two too. parents. Yeah. And that happens in most of a lot of families. Mm -hmm. But now he has, what the Bible say, he said, leave mother and father yeah. and cling to the wife. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So they got to be, to make it, they got to be understanding of one another. Mm -hmm. Now, he can help mama, but mama can't take over yeah. for the wife. Mama can't come before the wife. Definitely. Yeah. He and should help what... mama. He should help mama. Mm -hmm. But mama can't be put before the wife. 
And the wife got to understand that he need to help mama and would, would help that much more if she get there and help mama. Mm -hmm. If they do something together, and, and, and that works better mm -hmm. than doing it separate. Well, what if the mother, the mother-in-law doesn't like the daughter-in-law? Well, see, they got a problem. Yeah. Is she saved? See, yeah, yeah, yeah. see that, that, that's that, the that, main see, thing. That's the main thing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the Bible and being salvation and saved. Mm -hmm. I tell us been a couples like the, I done married four couples and, and thank God that they all are still together. But I always told them, that, you know, if they didn't do counseling, I couldn't marry them. And I, I thank God for the counseling part because there was things that they didn't know that they found out about one another before they decided to move forward. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, we say, you know, if I'm going to eat at the table, put everything on the table. Don't leave nothing out. Because when you leave something off the table and later on you, you wind up putting it, then they're going to be wondering, where did this come from? How come you didn't put this on the table when we were setting the table? And uh, and like I said, I, I'm, I'm glad, you know, the 57 years you and your husband, you know, had because that gave me a lot of motivation even with me and my wife uh, you know knowing what she went through because of, you know and I think my wife was more to a point to where she felt like she was never able to actually be a wife like she really wanted to because the way things happened within that first year of marriage you know to wind up being pregnant having a miscarriage and then straight from a miscarriage three months later having a massive stroke you know, and you know, and still dealing with the stroke still today, and uh, and I think sometimes it hurts her because she feel like you know, uh, you know, would there ever be a point in time where I would get up and leave and it's saying that, and when you try to, you know, how do you really just, you know, give a person that true understanding, like, hey, I'm not going nowhere. You know, because I know at many times when, when your husband was going through what he was going through, you know, do you think it might have ever crossed his mind wondering, will my wife ever just leave me, you know? Uh, you know, because it, it crosses everybody's mind in some kind of way, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't know if he crossed his mind about leaving. I, I remember one morning, you see, I used to get up and go out and work in the garden. Mm -hmm. and we used to work the garden together, but after he got to, at one point, he could not go out in the yard and work in the garden. And I remember one morning I got up summertime, six o'clock, before mm. it got hot, and I was in the garden, and uh, he probably came to the door, he couldn't see where it was. So I went back inside, probably about 8.30 or something, and he was upset, I said, wrong? I thought you hadn't left me. I said, where am I going? <laughs> I said, I'm out in the yard, I'm trying to get some work done before, uh -huh. It get hot. <laughs> and I said, now where am I going? I don't know. But he was real sick then and he couldn't yeah. you know, walk outside like he usually would walk out or he'd mm -hmm. come sometimes sit outside and watch me work. And uh, and that was that's the one time that happened and he I said, Well, you know I'm not going away. I put him in the car and took him to uh, <laughs> the Waffle House and bought him yeah. some breakfast. <laughs> Yeah, that one my house will change your mind. Yeah, but that one time, you mm -hmm. know, you kind of went in the fence. What's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. I thought you had left. <laughs> but I was, I'd get up early in the morning before, you know, summertime before we get hot and work mm -hmm. out in the yard. But uh -oh. I remember that one time that happened. With all your kids, what was, naming each one of them, what was the worst time that you had with them? that you can remember that you had to get on them well let me see well one of them I remember she went to the store with some friends and the, the young lady that she went to the store with stole out of the store a cake mix or something and so the manager called me and I went there and he told me he said, well, she wasn't stealing but she was with the young lady that was so when I got her home, mm -hmm. I gave it to her, <laughs> real good, and went on about my business. And I looked, she's sitting in the living room with a bag of clothes. 
She gonna run away. I thought, oh, you gonna run away? I said, wait, wait, baby. I said, don't run. Let me give you another one. And I'm gonna hold the door open so you don't have to run because you might fall down the step. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna hold you though. You walk out and go on. And when you go, you keep on going. Mm -hmm. She went and put that bag down put them clothes <laughs> back in the room. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, all children do some of the things. I never mm. really had big trouble with mm. any of the children because in those days, my husband was the disciplinarian mm -hmm. and he was a hoy. Yeah. But uh, in those days, you know, we really didn't have a lot of problems with the children. Mm -hmm. Not like people have today. Mm -hmm. You know, the son, my, the boys. He went hunting on the weekend when they were teenagers. They didn't go out with the boys. They went hunting the weekend. Mm -hmm. Deer hunting during hunting season. They fish and after, even after they got grown and went in the service, they still hunt and fish. Stephen's still hunting fish. Keith mm -hmm. was still hunting and fishing. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the day, you know, he got killed. That's what he was out doing, fishing. Mm -hmm. And um, that's you know how he taught them my oldest son he said he just didn't like killing them little animals <laughs> but he'd eat them yeah but they didn't want to kill them huh? but he was a very humble child mm -hmm. you know? never had no no problem with them mm -hmm. they sing they danced you know and they went to school and trouble not not no trouble like people have today with children mm -hmm. did you ever have any trouble out of uh gwen no not really. Oh. Mm -mm. No, Gwen was, Gwen would really get there and take care of the other children. Mm -hmm. And she was smaller than, shorter than all of them. But she would get there and cook for them and, and take, really take care of them better than the oldest child did. Mm. And see, we were, we were taught, and I know my sister took care of her, as the older one take care of the smaller children. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like it was today. I know sisters and brothers, they don't take care of each other. But yeah, my sister, that's six years older than me, she's 90 years old now. She's still garden, rake leaves, and do all of that. Mm -hmm. But she took care of us. My mom went and worked, and worked in the white people's houses, cooked and ironed and washed and did. And Elizabeth was the oldest at that time. She's six years older than me. Mm -hmm. And she took care of us. And she learned to cook. And my mom started teaching. Uh, when you got 15 assistants, she, you learn to cook, boy or girl. Mm -hmm. My mom taught all the children. So she had four boys first. Those four boys taught their wives how to cook. And my mom, they had to come in the kitchen and cook. Yeah. No matter what age you are, you all the children. So that's the way we, and we were brought up to the older child took care of the younger one. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I brought my children up. You didn't hire babysitters. The older child was home, that, that child took care of the children that was home. And that's the way mm -hmm. they were. What, what do you see different now in this generation of uh, you know young adults that was, that, uh, that was different back in the time that you came up? Uh, one of the things I see now is, as far as eating, mm -hmm. the child said, oh, I don't eat this, I don't eat that. We ate what our parents put on the table. Yeah, definitely. And if you didn't want to eat what was put on the table, you had one other choice was cornbread and milk. Mm -hmm. But you ate what was put on the table when it was put on the table. Mm -hmm. And you didn't a child in you and tell a child and say, "Oh, I don't like this, or I don't want that." Uh, you you made grocery according to what the child wanted. Yeah. And we had to eat. You know, you ate vegetables and meat or whatever they cooked. Mm -hmm. You had to eat it. Yeah, you didn't you, make up your. You didn't books. make grocery according to what the child wanted. Yeah, I and, see that a lot. And and then you didn't talk back. Yeah. You didn't answer back. If you if you grunted, if they said something, do certain things, you said, hmm, you got it in the mouth. Oh, yeah. You didn't talk back. You didn't disrespect. Not only did 
disrespect parent. You didn't couldn't disrespect an adult. Period. period. Yeah. You didn't walk in a room and not speak. Mm -hmm. My dad said, if you don't speak, you're worse than a cat or dog. Because the cat or dog, when you speak to them, they're going to wag their tail and let you know they hurt. Mm -hmm. So nobody wanted to be a cat like a cat or dog. So you spoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You go to church, you sing. Because he said, every bird sing but a buzzer. So nobody yeah. wanted to be a buzzer. <laughs> so you went to church, mm -hmm. you sing. And you were respectful to anybody. I don't care if that person was a drunkard or whatever. Mm. He was an adult. You were respect. taught to respect that person. Amen. And you didn't, you know, talk about it. You know the person was telling the story on We didn't say lie. Yeah. Tell him. Who's it telling? The person comes and told your parent you did something. My dad was like this, you know. He said, and he'd ask you, not in front of the person. So and say the one said you did certain thing. You said, oh no, I didn't do that. And he said, okay. He said, because if you did it, you're going to do it again. So if you telling a story, say, oh, I didn't do that. They, but you couldn't call that person a liar. Yeah. And why was that? That was respect. You yeah. had respect, an mm -hmm. elderly person, an older person, and that uh, that's the way we had to be. Yeah. You did not talk back to people. You yeah. did not an adult. Mm -hmm. That's what we were taught. Yeah. Uh, if you can tell all your children uh something if this is just say just say if this was out the last video you have ever done. And you and you want to leave your kids with a, with a, a word of encouragement or or a quote. What would you tell each one of your kids? Tell a name, and then what would you tell that particular that particular child? Okay. Take with the oldest one. Start with the oldest one. With Deborah. To and all of my children love. I'm sure you have love in your home. Mm -hmm. But I tell Deborah to not be too concerned with what people say and people do. But do what the Bible tells you to do and try to keep peace. Mm -hmm. And I tell all of them to pray for peace. Gwen, she's a busybody. She loves helping all, and that's one thing I can tell all my children love helping people mm -hmm. and Gwen Gwen is going to be busy she's going to help she's going to do she's going to tell you what to do <laughs> <laughs> but but she's still going to you know what she's saying it for to help you mm -hmm. sometimes you might not want to help or need to help yeah. but she is going to try uh, Frida is quiet Sometimes she ain't gonna talk a whole lot, but she's grown up. She used to worry and be, how can I say it? Be, be concerned, say, and, and mm -hmm. everything. Things would upset her, least little thing would upset her. But she's not like that anymore. And she, she loved the Lord. She reads the Bible, she prays, and God is, has really helped her to grow up and not to be concerned with things that, you know, bother her. Yeah. Diane is a giver, always have been, really will help. She'll give you half of her nothing. That's just how I give them. Like I say, all of them will give, but Diane is really a giver. Mm -hmm. will help people. She'll go out of her way to help people. Uh, Junior is a very humble person. He sings and he'll help people also. But sometimes he don't speak up when he should about different things. Mm -hmm. uh, Sharon, she's gotten where she's she's Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> But she has a husband and she takes care of him and he works and takes care of her. 
so um, Stephen well he just married his second wife a second time he has his own way when I tell him to be peaceful love and treat people like you want to be treated Kena, she's really got it kind of tough because she's teaching. She has a special needs child. And I tell her to really, like I tell her all the time, to get rest, but keep a job that she can spend time with the children is more important than making a big salary. Yeah. And to love her family and her husband and she has a husband that helps her and they are all of them are wonderful children I really have to say because they help me yeah and I tell them don't don't give or don't do that and they tell me like stop telling people don't tell them don't give you <laughs> <laughs> let us give let somebody give you what they want to give you mm -hmm. but I thank God for children that love and respect me Amen. And they fall either out with each other, but that's when they don't stay angry with each other. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for that because I've seen many families really separate and never get back together. But yeah. mine, they will stay together and they will get together and do things for me, and I thank God for it. Amen. And I'm going to say this that when my husband died, you know, I told God, I said, Lord, this is a two-check house. And uh, I don't know how I'm going to make it with this one little check. But God bless me to have a couple with two children move right next door to me. And they were from Honduras. And me, I, if I'm neighbor, I go and meet my neighbor, introduce myself. Well, I did with this couple. And one day I was at their house and they said, uh, Miss Evelyn, will you keep the two children? They were like eight and 10. And the wife was working when she was pregnant. I said, will you come and keep the children for me? And how much would you charge? I said, Lord, thank you, Jesus, because this is a job. <laughs> I just told God, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that this is a two check house. Yeah. And these people are offering me a job right next door. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to do them, just go sit down. Yeah. Children take care of themselves, really. And that was a blessing from the Lord. Amen. So the one check, like I said, it was a two check house. So the one check paid the bills. And the other that I got from them, and they didn't pay me in check, they paid cash money. Amen. I never seen so many hundred dollar bills. I get a hundred dollars every week. Yeah. Two hundred. And that was, was spending money, and I always like to support the church. Mm -hmm. And God just blessed me to meet these people. And I end up driving the children to school. I get paid for that. Mm -hmm. I go there and sit down, just sit on the sofa, take my crochet needle and crochet. Mm -hmm. And they paid me an hour to $50. That's nothing but God. Yes, Nothing me. but God. So like I said, he will supply your every need. Just mm -hmm. trust him. Have faith in him and live a right and a righteous life. Amen. God will supply you every need. I know mm -hmm. it. I believe it. I don't have to be. I know it for a fact. Yeah. For a fact. Yeah. That even with this pandemic, I had it last March. We went to church on the third Sunday in March, the following Saturday. Mm -hmm. I lost all taste, smell. Couldn't smell nothing, taste nothing. But Lord, I didn't go to no doctor. Mm -hmm. I couldn't smell bleach. I couldn't taste Dr. Titian antiseptic. Mm. But God blessed me to go through it. I had some rough week or so. But I just kept on going. Mm -hmm. I'd get in the bathtub full of hot water and I'd, I'd feel if I drank water, it felt like the water was boiling in my mouth. That's how hot. But I kept going. I'd 
scrub the floor. I just kept doing it. Kept Got doing on the prayer day. line. Mm -hmm. We had prayer every day. Got on the prayer line. Then I called. God told me to enlighten a couple of preachers in the church. Yeah. And I called and asked them certain questions. And I enlightened them what they were not saying right. Yeah. And, you know, one, you know, sometimes people think we I said, no, I'm not teaching you. Yeah. I said, and God said, enlighten you. And enlighten me, you in a room with a light bulb, 50 watt bulb. Mm -hmm. And I come in with a 60 watt bulb and yeah. made a little light of what you already knew. No, yeah. And so God told me to do this. Mm -hmm. And I did that. God blessed me during that time. I didn't leave out of this house. My son-in-law worked at Walmart at night. I'd call him and tell him what the what I needed. My son would bring stuff for me and another young lady in the church that called me mama. And those three people brought shop for me. Mm -hmm. I had my garden, they brought dirt, plants and everything. <laughs> That's how God will take care of you. You just do what he say do. Mm -hmm. And one of them, an ex daughter in law brought me a whole bag of jigsaw puzzles. So I put 2,000 piece puzzles together mm. during that time. I bought gas third Sunday in March. I didn't buy gas again for my car until June. Nobody but God. Nobody but God. Didn't leave out of here and go nowhere until mm -hmm. June. But I had my garden and an abundance of everything in the garden. My apple tree had so many apples on it, she was leaning. The pear tree had so many pears on it, the limbs were breaking. And and I had peas and stuff in the garden. Like, you know, everything. There was an abundance mm -hmm. of everything. Like I told my church, I said there was an abundance last year of virus, but also an abundance of fruits and vegetables. But you know, I saw people get in line and go and pick up so much stuff as yeah. they did last year. But God blessed. And you just trust God. And he, he will bring you through whatever you have to go through. One time, once doing, while I had the, the virus, one night, I remember, I feel like I wasn't breathing too good. Mm -hmm. And all at once I said, Lord, you got to help me. Yeah. And seemed like it was a flap that opened and I was able to breathe. Amen. And I didn't go to a doctor until after, after it was all over. And I went to the doctor and I asked, you know, I said, I told him, I said, I had the virus. And he gave me a test. He said, yeah, you had it. And he gave me a blood test saying, you got antibodies. And then the following month, he said, you know, of all the people I tested, you don't want had, only one had antibodies. Look at that. Nothing but God. Yeah. Nothing but God. So I just tell anybody, just trust God, believe and have faith. Mm -hmm. And do what is right. The, with the best of your ability. Do good. Yeah. So at least give it a an initiative to try. Then not to try. Stop saying what you can't do without first trying to do it. Do do it. Yeah. Like I said, when I when I had the virus about four days before Easter, because I saw the, the third and the last of March. E Easter was about called the third Sunday, I think, in April. And it had been raining. Mm -hmm. About four days before Easter, had four beautiful days. I got out here in this yard, and I started pulling weeds. And I started doing things in the yard. And God just had me to get well, not, but I'm tell you, I have one while after, I walked from my door to the mailbox and back, I'd be so tired. And I would ask him, why am I so tired? Mm -hmm. But that was the virus. Yeah. But I didn't stop. Amen. I kept going. Yeah. And I'm still going. And I believe thank if you would have, if you would have stopped, you would have gave up. But Amen. thank God that you didn't. I don't give up. Right. I still stay busy. Amen. Thank God I'm able yeah. to. Well, y'all look here. This is just part one. 
we got more stuff to talk about. Mama didn't even realize we almost been out here a whole hour. Mama said, I don't know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Look at that, almost a whole hour. So we're gonna talk again, but this is part one. Uh, the life and the journey of Miss Evelyn Wilder. All right, love y'all.